morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. I appreciate so much the uh, the worship that we've bat- we've had today, and uh, the leadership of Brandon and the team. Uh, it's been so good to worship the Lord together. Amen. This is a special time when you're able to come and worship Jesus with each other, right? Uh, we we love these times. We don't want to forsake these times. So it was beautiful. Uh, I just want to kind of give you another introduction to me. I know some of you probably are saying, who's that guy? And so I uh, just kind of want to let you know who I am. Um, as you can see, my name is Chuck Irby, and uh, my wife is Barbie, and she's right down here on the second row. Uh, and Barbie and I have been married almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years this August, and uh, we're really excited about that. And um, you know, our love for each other is just growing uh, each and every year, and uh, I just love her so much. Uh, we have three kids, uh, adult children, um, Leah, Sadie, and Laban. Uh, Leah is married to Andrew, and uh, Sadie's uh, single, and, and Laban is married to Jennifer. And so we feel like we have not three kids, but five kids, because we love them all uh, the same, and they're, they're all very, very special to us. Um, Basically, uh, I've been a, a pastor for 20 years, uh, been, been ministering for 20 years. Started out at uh, Bars Mill Church of God in Sugar Creek, Ohio, uh, right there in the heart of Amish country. Uh, some of you are probably, yeah, I know where that's at because you've been there and gone through shops and things like that. But it was a wonderful place to start. It was a great church, and uh, we had a great experience there. Um, was there for a couple years, and then we took the position at Barberton Church of God. And so we packed up everything that we had and uh, moved to Summit County, and uh, we've been up here uh, ever since, and we were there for almost 18 years, uh, one month shy of 18 years. Uh, so I just say it's 18 years because uh, it, it felt like it, but um, anyway... A great experience there as well, and I uh, love the Barberton Church of God. They're great people. But uh, resigned from there last November, uh, not this past November, but the November before, November 2020, uh, at the end of the month. And um, I have been working at a place called Christian Healthcare Ministries ever since. And my wife works there as well. And so we, we work there together, uh, not in the same area, different departments. Uh, she works in... Uh, member services, and uh, I actually started in data entry and did that for 10 months, and uh, then I moved to the mailroom, and so I've been working in the mailroom now for about four months, and, uh, and I love it. It's really fun, and uh, we, we enjoy uh, our jobs because we're helping people who are going through very difficult things medically, and we're helping them pay, pay those bills, and many of you know what that's like, and so... Uh, it's a really a great job, and it's a great place to be, and it's, it's ministry for sure. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, about me. Uh, I'm 51 years old, so I'm just trying to cover all your questions that you'll leave asking today. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's really great to be here with you today. Um, really, most of all, what I'd like to tell you about myself, uh, if I was to tell you anything at all, is that I love Jesus um, my relationship with Jesus is what means the most to me. Uh, he is so good to me. He is patient. He is loving. He is gracious. He is gentle and he is kind. And he shows me all of those things, maybe all those things just in one day. Sometimes before I get up and go to work in the morning. <laughs> Uh, but he is so good to me, and I love his presence in my life, and I, I feel like I commune with him all day long, and um, I consider it a, an amazing and wonderful privilege to be able to preach and teach the Word of God, and so uh, I appreciate this opportunity that you're giving me, and uh, I, Barbie and I just, uh, we love being here. We're, we're excited to be here, and so however long this lasts, we'll be excited to be here with you guys. And so, great to be here. I want to start out today uh, just by asking a question. Um, 
Actually, before I do that, let me just uh, take care of something before, before I forget. Um, Barbie's uncle passed away this week, and uh, we are going to a funeral today at 3 o'clock in Coshocton. And so uh, we may kind of skedaddle out of here quickly today. That won't be our norm, but that is something that we're probably going to need to do today to make sure that we're down there in time because late last night we got word that the pastor who was going to do the funeral uh, has to quarantine because of COVID issues. And so Barbie, who is also an ordained minister of the Church of God, is going to do the funeral today. And so uh, we would appreciate your prayers for our traveling and also for uh, Barbie as she tries to speak words of, of comfort and peace and also point people to look to Jesus because that's what it's about, right? Amen. Amen. So I want to start out with a question today. And the question is simply this. Um, have you ever lost something that uh, is valuable? Anybody? A wallet? Yeah. Uh, a cell phone? Yeah. Boy, what? when we lose cell phones these days, it's like panic, right? Because it's like our life is on there, you know? Uh, so that's kind of scary. But um, maybe keys, car keys or house keys. You ever lost one of those? And then uh, we, we tend to sometimes lose these, right? And sometimes, I don't know about for you, but for me, every once in a while, I lose them. And they're right there. Yeah. Anybody? Am I the only one? Oh, good. I'm so glad there was hands that were raised. Um, I don't want to be the only one that loses glasses on top of my head. You know, when we lose things like that, it, it's, they're, they are valuable. Of course, a wallet. We, we get scared if we lose a wallet because it's like, you know, it's got credit cards or debit cards or cash or, you know, our, our ID or, you know, a lot of things in it that we're just, it kind of freaks us out. But, you know, really, when you get right down to it, those are, are temporary things, right? Th those are temporary. And uh, when we lose something that's temporary, even if it's valuable, it's good for us to remind ourselves, you know what, that's, that's just a temporary thing. That's, that's just one of those earthly things. You know, when I was five years old, which is now has been quite some time ago, but when I was five years old, my family and I, and, and it was my mom and dad and my sister and myself, uh, we were in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, of course, this was like 1975. And in 1975, one of the big places to shop in Columbus, Ohio was called Eastland Mall. Some of you know what that is. I'm not talking about Easton, okay, because there's a big shopping area in Columbus now called Easton but this was Eastland Mall, and it was right off of I-70 on Hamilton Road, huge mall, really big for that time of, uh, you know, the, that year or whatever. And we were there at Christmas time, and so we were there in this jam-packed mall in Columbus, Ohio, which is kind of a big city, and somehow, I don't know how because I was five, I don't really remember it very well. I got separated from my mom and dad. Now, that's a scary thing, isn't it? Moms and dads, is that scary? Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? I was separated from my mom and dad for about an hour. <laughs> you want to talk about an eternity. <laughs> that seemed like an eternity to them. And so... For about an hour, my mom and dad had pretty much everybody worker related in that mall looking for me. I mean, everybody, security, store workers, there were people scouring that mall looking for this little blonde haired boy. Yes, I was a little blonde haired boy when I was five. And they were looking for me and they could not find me. Well, that is because I was out in the parking lot roaming around the parking lot. And this guy on a motorcycle, God bless motorcycle guy, right? He saw me and he, he thought, you know what? That little guy shouldn't be out here. And he parked his motorcycle. He grabbed me by the hand. He took me in 
to the security. And I want to tell you, when my mom, and I know all this because they've told me, when my mom and dad uh, were able to put their eyes on me, you can't imagine the relief and the joy and all of the, the emotions that were that present in their life, you know. Um, now, fast forward about 25 years. Barbie and I were in Sears in the mall in New Philadelphia, and uh, we were looking at whatever. I think we were in the electronics department. We were looking at televisions or something. And uh, all of a sudden, we looked around, and our daughter, Sadie, was gone. Now, some of you are saying, see, what happened when, when you do things as a kid, it comes back to get you when you're a parent. And I, and I think I'm a firm believer of that. I really do. But she was gone. And, and I thought, you know, we, we thought, well, we'll go to the next aisle. She'll be there. She was, I think she was around four years old. Go to the next aisle. She'll be there. We went to the next aisle. She wasn't there. Next aisle. She wasn't there. She wasn't in the department. She wasn't in the store. Now, we didn't lose her for an hour. Thank goodness. <laughs> I think it was like 15 to 20 minutes. But I want to tell you, 15 to 20 minutes, not knowing where your kid is, it feels like 15 to 20 hours. It really does. And I can remember, and this, this is where it really gets kind of crazy and it, and it gets real. And I, I just want to like let you know the kind of ways that we, were, we began, even at 15 to 20 minutes, we began to process this. Because even at 15 to 20 minutes, we started to think, about life without her. Can you imagine that? It's a, it's a really <laughs> horrific thought. It really is. I started to think, and, and I know Barbie as well, we, we, bat, we, we actually both started to think what it would be like to tell family members that we lost Sadie. We lost our little girl. And I want to tell you, those are some devastating thoughts. And, and thank the Lord that after 15 to 20 minutes, we actually walked out of Sears and she was in one of the stores close by to Sears. You know, and this, this lady, this worker in, in one of the stores was like, is this your little girl? <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, we want to jump up and we want to squeeze the lady, you know. It's amazing. I, losing a child, even temporarily, is devastating. It's difficult. It's beyond words difficult. And so with that in mind, and I want you to kind of like, I want you to kind of this morning to just kind of like grasp those feelings. Just kind of imagine what those feelings would be like. Imagine what those thoughts would be like, those thoughts rolling in your head. I just want you to really kind of grab a hold of those feelings and those thoughts because I want to take you to a portion of Scripture that it's one of those portions of Scripture. It's like we read it and, and then it, it's kind of, it jumps out of the birth of Jesus and him as a baby and then boom. He's 12 years old. And then right after that, boom, he's an adult, you know. And so it's kind of chronologically, it's one of those scriptures that it's just like, it's just there. But it's there for a reason. And so I want to take you to, to Luke uh, chapter 2. Uh, Luke chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 41. And uh, we're going to read through 52. And, uh, you know, I... I want to do something here with you while, while I'm here with you as, as the one who's preaching and teaching the Word of God. Uh, when we do the main scripture, I'm going to ask you, if you will, if you're able, will you stand with me as we read through the scripture? And let's read through it together. So every year, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. 
Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down to with, with them to uh, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. Amen. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word. Can you imagine losing Jesus? <laughs> really, I mean, can you imagine losing Jesus? Think about it just for, for a minute. I, we already talked about, from my perspective, what it was like to lose a, a child or what it was like for my mom and dad to lose a child. And that was temporary, a lot more temporary than three days. Uh, but can you imagine losing Jesus? You know, the, the angels... An angel appeared to, uh, appeared to Mary, uh, told her that she was going to give birth to the Son of God. An, an angel appeared to Joseph, confirming all of that. Uh, shepherds, when Jesus was born, shepherds came, uh, you know, just, just confirming the, the, the miracle, confirming the miraculous birth, uh, confirming that this was the Messiah, God's Son. Uh, Magi from the east came and confirmed it as well. There were signs and wonders. They knew that Jesus was special, that Jesus was given to them by God. And can you imagine with that thought in mind, which is kind of added to the fact that, you know, it's your, your child. Can you imagine with that in mind, can you imagine losing Jesus? Can you imagine the, uh, <laughs> you can't make excuses to God, Right? <laughs> he knows. And so, I, you know, I can't imagine losing Jesus. But let's, let's start with some important background information. And really, we get this from the text. Uh, this isn't really outside the text, maybe one thing. But just, this is mostly just in the text here. Mary and Joseph had made the annual trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And, and they had celebrated the Passover, and they were on their way home. Uh, the Passover was the biggest festival, you know, of the, of the Jewish calendar. It was that time in which they remembered God's deliverance from Egypt. And so it was such a huge festival and people from all over traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of the Passover. And so Jerusalem, which was already a big town, a big city in that time period, actually became very much inundated with people during the Passover festival. And so they would have been dealing, during the Passover, they would have been dealing with a huge crowd, a lot of people. And so you think about that, and during that uh, big crowd with so many people around, they didn't, they didn't lose Jesus then, <laughs> right? That's not when they lost Jesus, Okay, so they were on their way home. They had gotten through the, the festival and they were on their way home. Verse 43 says that as Mary and Joseph were heading home, Jesus stayed behind and they didn't know it. Now that may sound strange, especially when you see, as you read through the, the scripture text, you see that they had been traveling for a day. You say, well, they're traveling for a day and they didn't realize that they didn't have Jesus with them. Well, the, the text kind of helps us to understand why. You see, when, it, when we uh, read the text, we actually begin to understand that in verse 44, it tells us that they were traveling with a traveling party. 
And as they uh, were traveling with this traveling party, what was happening here was uh, many times when they would go to festivals, the Jewish festivals, uh, people would travel in caravans. They would travel together. And the reason for that is there's safety in numbers, right? You travel together because there's safety in numbers. And so they were traveling in this large caravan. And so it's interesting because, and this is the, the piece that is really not in the text, but uh, as you read through some of uh, the history and, and the cultural things, uh, there's a historian, a Jewish historian named Josephus. And Josephus actually said that many times that the Jewish people would travel in big caravans, sometimes the whole town would travel together. And so we're not talking about, really what I think is happening here is we're not talking about a small caravan of people. We're not talking about 10 or 12 people. You know, anybody, I've, I had a Dodge caravan. Anybody else have a Dodge caravan? It would seat seven. I'm talking, we're talking more than seven, okay? More than seven, more than probably 12, more than probably even maybe 20. We're talking about a large caravan of people, possibly most of Nazareth traveling together. And so with that, you kind of understand how Jesus would be with others and traveling with others. And you can see how uh, Mary and Joseph would have not really thought it to be a big deal that they hadn't seen him for hours. You know, they thought that he was traveling with family members. He was walking with family. He was walking with neighbors. He was walking with friends. And so before we go labeling Mary and Joseph as bad parents, uh, understand that there's something different going on here. Now, I told you when I was five, I was lost for an hour or so. I told you when uh, Sadie was four that uh, we lost her for about 15 to 20 minutes. Jesus was lost for at least three days. Now, you could say four. It seemed like maybe it's four when you think that they were traveling for a day and then it says they looked for three days. But uh, it's, it's also very possible that the one was included in the three. But whether it's three or four, doesn't really matter at that point, does it? Three days, four days, it's still a very long time, right? Now, when Mary and Joseph went back to Jerusalem, they entered a city that was estimated to have 75 to 80,000 people as the population. Now, that's a pretty big town, isn't it? 75 to 80,000 in a, in a uh, really kind of a smaller area. And so they went back to this really large town, a lot of people, and they began to look for Jesus. And it's obvious that they didn't go straight to the temple because if they would have went straight to the temple, it wouldn't have taken three days. They would have journeyed back the day, the, the day's journey, straight to the temple, and there he is, right? So it's obvious they didn't go straight to the temple. They probably went to some other places and began to look in other places. Maybe the marketplace, maybe they were looking there. Maybe they had uh, family members or friends that lived in Jerusalem, and so they went to their houses to see if he was there. Maybe they went to areas where children were typically playing. We really don't know where they went, but we know they didn't go straight to the temple. So it makes sense that Jesus' answer to his mother was a question. Why? Were you searching for me? Isn't Jesus amazing? I mean, even at 12, he's answering questions with questions. And it's fantastic because if we read through the scriptures, you read through the gospels, don't we uh, see Jesus doing this quite often? He's, he's a lot of times answering questions with questions. This is actually something that, that uh, rabbis and teachers did a lot of times because what they would do is they would answer a question with a question, causing the one who asked the question to think further and deeper into the question they just asked. Does that make sense? <laughs> and so this is what Jesus does. At age 12, he asks a question to answer the question. 
But the question that he asks implies you should not have had to search. You should have been able to come straight here to the temple. (laughs) Now, at this point, let us... Let us not just read through the scripture and just kind of like we do sometimes without thinking about what it must have really actually been like, okay? So Mary and Joseph, um, and we'll kind of focus on Mary here because she's the one with speaking to Jesus, uh, has just been looking for their son for three days, can't find him. Now, we could easily take the emotion out of that, right? If, let me stop here. If I walk to a certain point, am I out of the camera? I don't want to like not, right about here? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to like walk out of the camera for the people watching at home. Um, A mom looking for her child for three days Let's not take the emotion out of this, okay? I believe that she probably had bloodshot eyes at this point. I believe that at this point, she was frazzled beyond frazzled, that she had not had sleep, that she was grieving in her heart of hearts. She was grieving and she was so upset. Now, can you imagine, you put yourself in her shoes. Can you imagine being to that point emotionally and coming, finding your son, seeing him and saying, why, (laughs) why have you done this? And the answer that you get is, why were you searching for me? What? (laughs) What? Now, I can tell you this, I wouldn't have dared have said that to my mom. (laughs) 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 Woo, (laughs) I would have been in trouble. (laughs) And, And really, it seems like it's, okay, just bear with me on this, okay? Because I'm going, I'm going further. It seems like a smart aleck answer. It It does. It seems like a smart aleck answer. But do you know that in communication, that there are really three important facets of communication? What we say, how we say it, and what we look like when we say it, right? Really, those three things matter a whole lot when we're communicating with each other. And so... I really believe with all my heart that as Jesus said these words, (laughs) why were you searching for me? I believe that at 12 years old, he had an understanding of what it meant to be able to ask that question in a way that was, was tender and was respectful. I believe that because we know that Jesus never sinned. And I believe that when we're a smart aleck with our parents, that that's sinning. (laughs) So I really believe that as Jesus asked this question, it was tender. It was was, uh, asked in a way that was was sympathetic. And, And I believe that as he asked this question to his mom, Mary, that that Jesus' tone just kind of like helped settle her heart. And isn't that true of Jesus? Isn't it? I don't know if you've ever been frazzled and you've turned to Jesus. He has a way of settling us down, doesn't he? He has a way of calming our heart. He even has a way of bringing understanding when things really don't make sense. And so there are a lot of important things that we could get out of the scripture text. And actually, when I was going through this text this week and I was journaling about it, 
uh, when I journaled about this text, I actually didn't get any of what I'm going to give to you today in my journal. But that is the word of God, isn't it? I mean, when we read the word of God, it's like Brother Freimeyer said last week, we come to the word of God with a, a shovel and a pickaxe, right? Because it's so deep and it's so wonderful and we can get so much out of it. And so this morning, just as in, in these, these few more moments here, I, I want to just talk about some of the things that I see in this that I got out of it uh, one of those times that I went through it. And I want to share those things with you. And here's the question. How do we lose Jesus? How do we lose Jesus? Well, first of all, I don't believe that it's typically intentional. I don't believe that it's typically intentional. And what I mean by that is I don't think anyone sets out on their journey with Jesus to lose sight of him. I don't believe that we uh, set out on our journey with Jesus to lose contact with him, lose fellowship with him, lose relationship with him. Sometimes I believe that what happens is we just get too busy. Hmm? Say busy. Is busy good or is busy bad? It can be either, can it? It really can. It can be either. Busy is interesting because sometimes we just get too busy and we have so much going on and we have so many things uh, happening in our lives. We have a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak. And I want to tell you that uh, in this time that we're living in, Anybody know that we have a pandemic going on? I'm not here to remind you of that. You get enough of that throughout the days, throughout the weeks. When the pandemic hit in March 2020, when it really, when it really hit, they started closing everything down. Life kind of you know, life was like, and then all that happened and it went, right? And everything slowed down. It was interesting because for about six months, three, four, six, whatever, it just seemed like we weren't as busy. We had more time. I don't know what you did with your time, but maybe you read more or maybe you got in your Bible more or maybe you've spent time with family more or you prayed more or, you know, there's a lot of things that we could do with that time all of a sudden that we found ourselves uh, having. And so uh, with, with, with that, we, we just did less. And we have more time to devote to the eternal stuff. Now, it's interesting because I think that's one of the good things that God wanted to do with this. You know, we have that scripture in, in Romans, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, right? Romans 8, 28. And we, we, we think about that and we know that when things happen in our life that are difficult, that are bad, that are, that are really hard for us to understand, and things are, are happening that we just can't figure out, we, we realize that our God is so loving and so gracious that he'll even take moments like that and make something good out of it. He'll even take moments like that and do some good things in our lives, right? I know I've, I've experienced that. I, I hope you've experienced that as well. I certainly have experienced that myself. That God will take the most difficult things and bring some good. 
And I believe that that's one of the things he wanted to do. And, and I believe that that was one of the things that was in his intent and his plan. But here's what's sad. I don't think that we really got it. Because I think while God was trying to get our attention and while God was trying to help us to, to realize that we needed to focus more on eternal things, eternal stuff, that we spent that six months revving up our engines. <laughs> it's like, okay, God, we're in this law, but I'm ready to go. When the mandates are lifted, when things like let loose, I'm ready to take off and get going again. And I think we missed something that God had for us. See, busyness isn't necessarily bad, but it's not necessarily good either. What really matters is what exactly does God want us to do? What kind of uh, priority does God want us to have in our lives? See, busyness is often filled with good things, and it's often filled with things that in and of themselves are good for us to do. There wasn't anything wrong with Mary and Joseph going back to, to, uh, to Nazareth, where they lived. Wasn't anything wrong with that. I'm sure that you ever packed for a trip? Is it crazy? It's crazy, right? You're trying to make sure you have everything. You're trying to make sure that everything fits in a trunk or whatever the case may be. You're, you're trying to make sure that you're ready for the trip. And it kind of gets chaotic sometimes. And I'm sure that as they got ready to go back to Nazareth, they had to make sure of this and that. And they were busy and they were getting ready to travel. And they started out on their journey and they were doing something good. They were going home. But in the busyness, they forgot Jesus. And every step they took on their way home to Nazareth was a step further from Jesus. And church, can I tell you that when we get too busy, that sometimes every step that we take in our busyness is one step further away from Jesus Also, we get careless. We stop paying attention to Jesus and give our attention to other things. I, I believe one of the best analogies for this is our relationships. Husbands start taking their wives for granted. Wives start taking their husbands for granted. Friends start taking their friends for granted. We take our kids for granted. Kids take their parents for granted. We take our grandparents for granted. We, we just begin to get careless in our relationships. And when we get careless in our relationships, we, uh, we tend to not give them the attention that they deserve or the attention that they need to be given. And so what happens is when we stop paying attention to the people in our life that we love, our relationship begins to crumble. It begins to deteriorate. It begins to uh, be fragile. And sometimes if it goes too long or too far, the relationship will crumble completely and be lost. When I was, when I was wooing, <laughs> wooing Barbie, you like that word wooing? It's not a word we use very much. When I was courting Barbie, when I was dating Barbie, whatever. When I was wooing, I was, let's go with wooing. When I was wooing Barbie, uh, when we began to date, I would write her notes. I would send her cards. I would take cards to her. I would give her gifts. I would drive in the middle of the night to put a note on her windshield so that she would see it in the morning. I, we, we lived 30, 30 miles from each other when we started dating. I would drive 30 miles to see her for five minutes before she'd go to school in the morning. I mean, I, 
I was devoted to that relationship because I didn't want to get careless in that relationship. And I'm telling you that when we, when we are wanting a relationship to be vibrant and to be great and to be wonderful and to be everything that it can be, we have got to be very devoted and intentional about that relationship. So why are you, uh, what are you doing in your life to be with Jesus? <laughs> what, what are you doing in your life to make sure that you're working on that relationship with Jesus? How much effort are you giving to spend time in his word? Uh, what is your prayer life like today? When you sing of his love and his grace, do you sing it to him with passion? I, I, was, I was scrolling Facebook yesterday, and um, there's a, a singer, a gospel singer, his name is Mark Lowry, and uh, he put this little video on his page of this little kid singing a worship song. And if you can see it, you gotta go, you got to go look at it. It's, it's just amazing. It's fantastic. This little kid is pouring his heart out to Jesus. And sometimes I wonder, you know, because we, we talk about having passion in worship. We talk about, you know, being passionate in our worship for the Lord and we sing songs. And, and I hear some people say, well, but I'm just not an emotional person. I just, you know, I don't get that way. I, I don't get too worked up over anything. And then I hear you talking about the ball game. Or I hear you talking about the latest movie or whatever, whatever the case may be. And I want to know, I want to know how is your passion for Jesus, how does that stack up with those other passions that you have in your life? I want to tell you this morning that your passion for Jesus ought to far exceed anything else that's going on in your life. And that passion for Jesus, you ought to be working on that with all your heart, devoting yourself to that, be intentional about that. Do you commune with him throughout your day? Or would you say you are possibly getting careless? It all comes down to choices, doesn't it? We all have something with tremendous value at our disposal every day. Our choices, right? How many choices do you think you make every day? I, I, I'm almost convinced that we would all guess low on that because we make choices like constantly throughout our day. I mean, you make a choice when your alarm rings in the morning. You're going to hit snooze? <laughs> You're going to get up? Or are you just going to turn it off, <laughs> which is a bad choice? <laughs> we make all kinds of choices. And so when I think about the choices that we make, we are all making choices every day. And it all comes down to the choices that we make when it comes to our relationship with, with Jesus. Who are you choosing each day? What are you choosing each day? Do your choices reflect your relationship with Jesus do your choices strengthen your relationship with Jesus? Are the choices you're making every day helping you to stay arm in arm with Jesus or are they taking you away from Jesus? And if they're taking you away from Jesus, you just may lose sight of him completely. And listen to this last one. Do you know that your choices affect Many others who are in your life, they affect their view of Jesus. Your choices are so important. One of the things that I love is that when Mary and Joseph realize they have lost Jesus, they make a choice to turn around. I love that. It's, it's picturesque. It's symbolic. When they realize they have lost Jesus, they turn around. They stop going one direction and start going back the other direction towards Jesus. And I love that because here is my challenge for you this week. 
This is my challenge for you this week. Imagine yourself walking down a road and imagine uh, that whether or not you are walking hand in hand, arm in arm with Jesus. And, and I want you to, to, to imagine uh, this as like your spiritual life. In your spiritual life, in your walk with Jesus, are you walking down that road with him, uh, arm in arm, hand in hand? Are you walking down that road and he is right by your side and you have that relationship, that close relationship with him? Is that the picture of how your spiritual life is going this morning? Or have you lost sight of him because of the busyness, because of the carelessness because of the choices that you have been making. I want you to be like Mary and Joseph. I want you to be like Mary and Joseph and choose to turn around in haste and earnestly seek him with your schedule. Earnestly seek Jesus with your passions. Earnestly seek Jesus with your choices. You see, because Mary and Joseph, when, they, when it says in the scriptures that they, uh, they turned around and went back to Jerusalem to seek him, that word seek actually comes from a word that talks about they looked up and down. They looked all over. The, they put their all into it. And so will you this morning, if you're, if you're imagining your spiritual life with Jesus right now, and it isn't that you're arm in arm with him. It isn't that you're side by side with him. There's some distance. Would you turn to him and earnestly seek him with all your heart? I want you to do that. I want to do that. I want my wife to do that. I want all of you to do that. Because you can't lose Jesus. Don't, don't lose Jesus for anything in this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, before the service, Sean was telling us that um, Aurora... Uh, needs some prayer, and, and he checked with her parents, and uh, they want her to be uh, anointed this morning and prayed for. And uh, certainly that's one of the things that we do in our relationship with Jesus in staying close to him. We bring those to him that need his touch, need his, his, uh, his healing touch, his presence. And so we're going to do that this morning. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Sean. He's going to anoint her and share scripture, anoint her and, and lead in prayer. So uh, will you do that? I'd like to call the Christian family up. Ryan and Rachel and Aurora and Braden. In a moment, I'm going to call the elders up as well. All that are willing, I ask that you all are. I believe in miracles, church. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. I've seen dead men spiritually and physically rise from comas, from atheism, from sin. I've seen physical healing on bodies, dogs, and humans alike. I see the love of God. I don't only always fully understand it, but boy, do I want to seek him and run closer to him. So this morning, with permission of Ryan and Rachel, uh, Aurora is dealing with some seizures. And when I say dealing with some, their entire family are, and they're experiencing it. I don't know the full detail, except what we've shared in our growth group messages. Um, but I know that God sees it, he sees her, he's with her, always. I've never done this in church with you guys, so I'm nervously excited. 
to ask God for a miracle. So we're going to lay our hands as elders on Aurora. We're going to pray for her. And this truly comes from James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will rise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So you've come lay hands on Aurora, please. I invite you to hold your hands out in your heart, physically, however you see it. But pray. Pray with us, please, church. God, we come to you. You make all things new. Soften our hearts so we can draw closer to you. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. But move through us, Lord. We cannot do anything without you. Your breath is what fills our lungs. Your touch is what heals our bodies and our souls. We know the victory is already won. We know the cross is empty. We know the tomb is empty. And we know the angels watch and they celebrate and they cheer for all who come to you and draw closer. Draw us closer, Lord. We know if you are willing, it will be done. We know that you want good things and you want healing on Aurora. Lord, I'm not beating around the bush. I, I ask, I beg you, I beg you, as an elder of this church, to heal Aurora, Lord. Take away the seizures. Take away the sickness. And let your light just fill that gap and outshine every darkness who has eyes to see. Please, Lord, lay your touch on her parents, Ryan and Rachel, and on her brother, Brayden. And let them see without a shadow of a doubt that our God lives and he roars like a lion. He is not afraid of this battle. I give you thanks, Lord. I ask for your healing touch on Aurora. We ask this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen.